For a thousand years and more before the written word, we had clothed ourselves in wool. Behind the spread of ancient empires followed the shepherd and the weaver. Only the fabric has endured. The origins are lost. Whose was the mind that first dreamed of spinning? And whose the hand that fashioned the primeval loom? No matter. These artifacts are testimony to the history of wool. Through all the ages since the dawning, wool has played a vital role in human culture, prized for its durability and warmth, for its texture and resilience, for its beauty setting standards of fashion and comfort, combining the dignity of art with the practicality of insulation. As a commodity, wool has multiplied the wealth of nations, financed the exploration of new worlds, and set the cornerstones of empires. In America, the woolen industry began rather modestly, with a few smuggled sheep and a measure of Yankee ingenuity. For wool was the heartbeat of England's economic power, and stringent trade regulations were designed to suppress all competition. By the Revolutionary War, nearly every colonial household had become a small textile factory. Homespun wool was a symbol of defiance against the harsh restrictions of the English crown. Ironically, though English law tried to suppress wool production in the colonies before the Revolution, English inventions made it flourish after. English inventions and the abundant water power to drive them. Within little time, the river valleys of New England echoed with the sounds of textile machinery. Today, woolen fabrics are manufactured with great speed and efficiency, but the basic process from fleece to fabric remains unchanged. There is no mystery in the shearing. It takes a skilled hand, nonetheless. The modern shearer is a specialist, plying his trade from ranch to ranch. In an older tradition, Shearing was the shepherd's task. With the onset of warm weather, he would drive his flock to a shallow stream for washing, and later sing an ancient ballad to the rhythm of the shears. Before raw wool can be worked, its natural oil, called lanolin, must be removed. Lye soap and iron kettles have long since given way to modern scouring vats, and the lanolin that once was waste is today transformed into a myriad of useful products. Once scoured, wool colors easily. The natural fiber accepts dye quickly and permanently. Dyeing can be accomplished at any of three stages. In the wool, or stock dyeing, permits blending of bright, simple colors to an almost infinite variety of subtle hues. Colors dyed in the wool have more depth and permanence, much as today the phrase indicates depth and solidness of character. Sometimes it may be preferable to dye wool after it has been spun into yarn. For solid color fabrics, dyeing of the whole cloth, called piece dyeing, is the simplest method. Brushing the wool straightens and blends the fibers in preparation for spinning. The technique is known as carding from la carde, the French word for teasel. The spiny part of this plant was once used for that very purpose. Carding by hand was a tedious process. The water-powered carding mill was a welcome improvement. The carding machine passes the wool through a series of rollers covered with wire bristles. The carded fibers are scraped free and gently rolled into strands of roving. The wool fiber is quite unlike any other. 
natural or man-made. Its surface is a series of overlapping scales, their free ends pointing toward the tip. On the animal, this encourages foreign matter to work its way out of the fleece. It also allows the fibers to tangle and lock tightly with one another, the key to wool's unique felting ability. Although the surface of the fiber tends to repel liquids, the spindle-shaped cells of the inner core are highly absorbent. Since moisture is absorbed into each fiber instead of remaining on the surface, woolen fabrics tend to feel dry and comfortable, even under extreme humidity. This same absorbency of wool has several other advantages. It gives the fibers more resilience, more resistance to wrinkles. It reduces static electricity, so a wool fabric clings less. Most important of all, this unique property of the wool fiber makes it naturally flame resistant. In a modern textile mill, giant carding machines produce roving in fine, continuous strands, many at a time. To the casual eye, roving looks much like yarn. However, it is easily pulled apart. Yet, simple twisting gives it strength. By law, in early Massachusetts, every household was required to produce its share of homespun cloth. The task of spinning usually fell to the unmarried women of the family. The walking wheel is just a memory now. The tradition of the spinster still lives on. It took as many as half a dozen spinsters to keep a single weaver busy. The spinning jenny changed the odds a bit. But a score of jennies and a hundred spinsters side by side couldn't match the output of one ring frame spinner in today's woolen mills. In weaving, sets of yarn are interlaced to form the fabric. Lengthwise yarns are called the warp. Those running crosswise are known as the weft, or filling. The warp is pre-measured and wound onto a large cylinder from which it will be transferred to the loom. The precise spacing of the yarns will make it easier to thread them through the heddle to the loom. Even today, threading must be done by hand each time a pattern is changed. Weft yarns are wound individually on bobbins. The spinster used to measure her yarn on a clock reel or weasel. After a number of turns, it would mark the yardage with a popping sound. Through the years, the loom has lost little of its gracefulness and simplicity. As the warp, is alternately raised and lowered. The weft is passed through crosswise with a shuttle, then tamped into place with a beater. Foot-operated harnesses control the lifting sequence of the warp. Each different color of the weft requires a separate shuttle. A powered fly shuttle loom performs these operations automatically. of a weave is yet another story that begins long before the threading of the loom. Fabric designers, sensitive to the changing tastes of fashion, create new designs or adaptations, different color schemes or textures. Romantic notions of the lonely artist, to the contrary, a contemporary designer usually works closely with fashion stylists and textile manufacturers. When a design is finalized, Swatches of fabric, pattern drafts, and other specifications are sent to the mill. Blending exact percentages by weight from basic shades, the mill designer is able to match the desired colors of each yarn and determine the requirements for dyeing. But color is only part of the design. 
The weave pattern is programmed into the power loom on a control tape, much like the roll on a player piano. The tape regulates the harness movements and selects the weft or filling threads in proper sequence. The newest looms no longer use a shuttle. Instead, the filling threads are propelled through the warp by a jet of air. After weaving, each length of fabric is inspected. At this stage, minor flaws can be corrected. As it leaves the loom, a woven fabric has a loose, rough texture. The weave is tightened by a process of controlled shrinkage called fulling. In early times, this was accomplished by trampling the cloth in a stream or a trough of soapy water. But wooden mallets were soon substituted for the fuller's feet. The modern fulling machine is somewhat less elegant, but more efficient, using pressure rollers in place of mallets. Shrinkage and fabric density are precisely controlled. In simple terms, fulling causes the wool to felt, creating a softer, denser texture. Special finishes can change the look and feel of wool in countless combinations. Brushing raises many fiber ends above the surface of the cloth to form a soft, luxurious nap. Shearing or singeing the nap gives a slightly smoother surface. Other textures are determined by the grade or blend of fibers by the twist and thickness of the yarn, by nubs or loose fibers added to the weave. The hard finish of a worsted gabardine or crepe is achieved by still another method. After carding, the wool is combed repeatedly to remove the short noil fibers that give a wool yarn its fuzzy appearance. Combing also straightens the remaining long fibers and lays them parallel. The result is a thick strand called top, which is gradually reduced by drawing operations to make thin, smooth roving. Spinning and weaving of a worsted from that point on differ little from the woolen process. Wool, the fiber of antiquity, the fiber of tomorrow. Matchless in its versatility, luxurious in its drape and texture, wool is one of nature's few renewable resources. Grazing upon land seldom used and sometimes scorned by other animals, sheep put little demand upon man's supply of energy. The fleece of next season is already growing, even as the wool of this season is being sheared. Thus, this marvel of nature will be with us long after synthetics have exhausted their source. Wool. It really is a natural.